Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors and your moderator. This is the club's second program in a special virtual series on the coronavirus in association with the Zetima Project. And please note, we've got two more coming up soon. On this Friday, April 3rd at 12 noon Pacific, we'll host a program called COVID-19 Emerging Tests, Vaccines and Cures. And that one has former FDA Chief uh, Mark McClellan, the former Senior Advisor to the NIH on Pandemic Preparedness, Ken Kelly, and the former Director of the U.S. Strategic National Stockpile, Greg Burrell. So if you're interested in what's going on with the technology to help us out with the coronavirus, go to that one on Friday at noon Pacific time. The following Monday, April 7th, I'm sorry, that's Tuesday, April 7th, at 4 p.m., uh, we will track how now it is Monday. We'll track how major hospitals, mm -hmm. physician groups, and health insurers are faring with reports from the field. And that will include Wright Laster, the CEO of Henry Ford Health System, Steve Strongwater, the CEO of the physician group Atrius Health, and mm -hmm. William Fleming, president of Humana Healthcare Services. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to stay informed on those programs on COVID-19 and also other topics. I should say these presentations are all free. Tonight's program is generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative as a collaborative, also a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are very grateful for their support and encourage you to follow their example. You can go to our homepage and make a donation to support the series and the nonprofit Commonwealth Club, which we proudly point out is the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. Now, Kaiser Family Foundation CEO Drew Altman who is to be the headliner tonight, is unable to participate in this evening's program due to health reasons. Fortunately, these are not at all related to the coronavirus. He's just lost his voice. Uh, however, there is a benefit to all of you. This program will be split into two parts. Tonight, we'll discuss the current state of the pandemic, where we're headed, and the responses by the government, the healthcare system, and the public. We are fortunate to have with us Kaiser Family Foundation Senior Vice President, Dr. Jennifer Cates, who was scheduled to be with us. And we also have added Dr. Josh Michaud, KFF's Associate Director of Global Health Policy. Then we will have Drew Altman back in full voice on Monday, May 4th at 12 noon Pacific, by which time the pandemic may have crested, we hope it will have, and we'll see how the healthcare system has fared in the meantime, how the public has responded, and what the impact on the 2020 election is likely to be. All three of these experts are with the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, which runs the leading tracking polls exploring American opinions about U.S. healthcare, and also operates KHN, the nation's largest healthcare newsroom. KFF, as the foundation is known for short, is nonpartisan and not for profit, and is quick to point out, is not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente. So I'll introduce you to our experts. Jen Cates is Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at KFF. She's a specialist on the policy aspects of pandemics and viral infections. Josh Michaud is Associate Director for Global, Global Health Policy at KFF. He is a former infectious disease epidemiologist with both the U.S. Department of Defense and the Johns Hopkins University. Josh is an expert on the types of models being used to forecast the spread of COVID-19 cases. I should say to our audience who are currently viewing this on YouTube, we invite you to submit questions for our panelists. You can do so by adding your questions to the comments. They will be forwarded to me, and I'll try to integrate as many of them as possible into the program. And as we get started, I want to point out that today is March 30th, 2020. That's important for those listening later via podcast or radio, uh, because things are moving so quickly. When I hosted the first program in the series for the Commonwealth Club on March 18th, I announced that day that the U.S. had about 7,500 COVID-19 cases, and nearly one-fourth of those cases had been identified over the prior 24 hours. Just 12 days later, we are at 161,000 cases. That is rapid growth, and of course begs the question we all have, which is, where are we heading? So let's start by thinking about that and what this looks like. Jen, I'm going to start with you. You know, anyone who is at least middle-aged has lived through several other pandemics in their lifetimes, uh, from AIDS, which has killed about 32,000 people worldwide, SARS, H1N1, and more. How does this epidemic compare with those and others? 
Great. Well, it's great to be here. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this uh, pandemic that we're all living through. Um, I think, you know, I, I came into my career focusing on HIV. So my experience with getting involved in, in wanting to look at infectious diseases was from that experience. And um, it's always, you know, we always want to compare um, uh, the current thing that we're going through to past experiences. And there are certainly some comparisons, you know, it was a new, it seemed new at the time. Um, people didn't know what was at the really early, didn't know what was causing it, what to do about it. There were no treatments, there were no cures. Um, and so in, in some ways there was some similar um, sense of in, incredible vulnerability across, you know, much of, uh, starting to get across much of the United States. But there are also some pretty big differences, um, and and they play out today. And I'd say one, I'll just highlight a couple. One is that um, you know with HIV, the the impact that that epidemic had early on in the United States, at least, was in certain communities that were already very marginalized: gay community, um, people who inject drugs, I and mean, groups that didn't really have as much, you know, weren't as accepted in society. And so there was that that aspect of the epidemic early on here really defined how it was seen. The other thing that's that's interesting about HIV that makes makes it stand out is that um, there, there's many years of immunity where you could be infected with HIV and not know it. Fast forward to what we're dealing with today, and we see from just the reports every day that anyone is can, is being infected. It really is not uh, singling out any one group by you know um, income, by race, um, by location, um, and the the immunity is much the the uh, sorry the incubation period is much shorter. So it's it's a faster moving um, disease, um, but it's actually having an incredibly far and fast reach, much more it's much more than than HIV ever did or it has. Um, so and, and there's other comparisons to I mean Josh could sp speak to this around SARS or H1N1, um, which are probably more directly applicable to to thinking about COVID. Is this one less deadly? Well, the the case fatality, the fatality rate, sort of how to understand um, how deadly a disease is, is an interesting one. And, and there's lots of numbers out there. And part of the challenge is when there's a new outbreak, it takes a while to really figure out what once you once you know how many people have it, then you can truly understand how um, deadly it is. And right now we're sort of in this phase of not exactly knowing how many people have this. With HIV before treatments. It was extremely deadly. Um, most people that became infected with HIV before there were treatments would get very sick and die. So that was much more deadly. Um, but with COVID, we actually, it's quite, it's the case fatality rate is not as high. Most people who come infected are around 80% don't get very sick and don't die. Um, so it's not as deadly. It's pretty infectious um, and, and it's spreading very quickly. And I, just, I could jump yeah. in just quickly, Mark, sorry. Um, and um, building on Jen's comments and, and talking about previous epidemics, I was going to uh, you know, say the circumstances for the emergence of this particular COVID epidemic uh, very much mirrored what we had seen in 2003 with the SARS epidemic, right? Uh, China was the source. This was a zoonotic, meaning it came from an animal and uh, jumped to humans caused a respiratory illness, which spread around the world. Um, and at first, uh, we looked SARS as a model for what we might expect with COVID. But it turns out that while SARS uh, caused about 8,000 cases worldwide that we know about, and about a little bit under 800 uh, deaths, uh, it was both more deadly in terms of the number of people who got infected, you, can guess around 10% of those who got infected uh, died from SARS. Uh, but uh, COVID has turned out to be uh, much more transmissible, clearly. Uh, and you mentioned the case numbers here in the United States. If you look globally, I mean, we are over, uh, you know, half a million cases that we even know about and, and uh, rising fast. So uh, we had to quickly readjust our uh, preconceived notions about whether this would be SARS part two. It's uh, similar in some ways in the way that it came out, but it's very different in terms of its epidemiology and its spread and its deadliness. And, and you know, public health has to react to the facts as we learn them on the ground. So, Josh, what do we know about the epidemiology of the disease and what don't we know that we wish we did? Well, we're learning every day. Uh, there's uh, 
we've only known about this a few months now, and it's amazing how much we have we have learned uh, even in that short amount of time. So we have a good idea that, for example, this virus is highly transmissible, and uh, we have different ways of measuring that. But you know uh, that it can transmit quite easily uh, from person to person, and therefore we can expect this transmission to continue in an ongoing fashion unless some uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, some public health measures are put into place to control that spread. Mm -hmm. We uh, have a uh, an idea of how deadly it is. Jen talked about how it might be difficult to get a handle on on how deadly a virus is, and certainly that's the case with COVID. Uh, the initial data from China seemed to show that it was a very severe disease and many people were dying from it. But what we didn't know was the full denominator, the number of people that were actually infected by the virus. And so we've come to get a better idea, but we still don't know the true extent of the infection. And so if we wanted to know the true uh, infection fatality rate, the, the chance that someone who got infected actually dies from it, we can only guess at this point, and we, we base that on modeling and, and base that on the, the, the samples that we have. So, uh, you know, we're looking at anywhere between 0.5% to, you know, 3% or even higher in some cases uh, for case fatality for uh, this virus, depending on the circumstances and the interventions that are put into place. Um, and, you know, another aspect of this virus, which makes it very difficult to control, is that we've come to learn that it has this uh, large proportion of people who can apparently transmit it while they're in the asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic phase, meaning uh, this is a virus that someone can be carrying and not realize that they have it, meaning they're not showing any symptoms, yet they may still be transmitting it. In fact, a significant proportion of transmission may be occurring uh, through this asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic before you develop symptoms group. This makes it a very different type of virus from SARS. And SARS mm -hmm. uh, was transmitted mostly by people who are symptomatic, you know, after they uh, developed symptoms, were they transmissible? Uh, that's not the case here. And it makes the challenge that much greater to put in control measures because if you can't identify who has the disease and who is transmitting the disease, you can't cut those transmission chains and, and stop it. Yeah. Right, right. One other one other thing I, I'll just add is we do have a pretty good sense from most of the countries that have good enough data that there doesn't seem to be a um, that people are more susceptible to becoming infected compared to others. What we do know is that once someone is infected, those who are older and those who are sick already have an underlying condition are much more likely to get severely ill and, and die. And that that might fluctuate a little bit based on other characteristics of countries and what their health systems are and their underlying health of the population. But in general, this is not something that seems to be having a big impact on kids, which is very unlike other things. Um, and it does seem to be having a big impact on people who are older, older than 60, older than 65, and those who have underlying health conditions. But kids may well be carriers, right? Yes. Kids may be right. carriers, yes. Yes, yes. Right. Good. You know, we hear a lot about uh, projections and predictions, and there's all kinds of epidemiologic models put together. And anybody who's ever created a model or even a simple spreadsheet knows there's a, you know, a garbage in, garbage out problem, too. And certainly, I've just seen a huge range of re predictions about cases, about potential deaths and so forth. Sometimes the predictions from the same model source, you know, change overnight substantially. So it, it, it makes me worry a bit. And Josh, I guess I'd ask you as the epidemiologist, what goes into these models? How do they work? And how, how much can we rely on them at this point? Well, models are useful tools. I, I tend to think of them as, you, you don't want to take at face value necessarily the estimates that are put out there, but they do set sort of parameters around what you might expect. And they're helpful to think about how different policies might influence the epidemic. But when you're thinking about designing an epidemiological model, there's a number of, number of different approaches. Uh, one common one is to really uh, assume that in a population, say, everyone is susceptible when the virus first is introduced, and then you sort of use mathematical equations to uh, determine how that infected person, how a person who is infected will then mix with the population and how the population will continue to mix over time, infecting some people 
and some of those people will recover over time. And if you have the basic epidemiological parameters like the incubation period, mm -hmm. the, uh, the infectiousness, the uh, severity of the virus, you can sort of plug those into the model and make uh, estimates about how many people might become infected. And then you mm -hmm. can throw all sorts of different uh, uh, layers on this and you can change the way that people mix uh, in the model. You can throw in you know, the effects of different interventions like social distancing uh, and what that might have on, on the ultimate impact. But, you know, the basic model here, because we know something about the transmissibility of this virus, if you took an unmitigated scenario, one in which there uh, were uh, no interventions put into place, then the best estimates are that you could be talking about anywhere from 20 to 60 percent of the population becoming infected with this virus over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but of course, we don't live in an unmitigated scenario, and yeah. uh, there are no expectations that uh, that the steps that we're taking now will not have an impact. I think that is important to take into consideration when when looking out at these projections. The worst case scenario is if we kind of do nothing. And uh, I know there's been some numbers thrown out about what that might be, but of course we're not doing nothing. We're doing something and that has an impact on, on your estimates. Okay, so if I put you on spot, because you're the epidemiologist on the call, uh, what's the model that you follow the most projections? And if you had to pick today, if you had to guess today, how many Americans do you think will succumb to this illness? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not going to fall into that trap. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, that I follow all the models out there and they give you a set. There is a, there's um, the model that I, I just described sort of uh, there's a group of uh, modelers, for example, out of Imperial College in London, which put, have put out a number of different estimates for the U.S., the U.K., and, and in fact, 202 countries around the world and how many cases and how many deaths we might expect. Um, there's another uh, approach that's put out by another group at uh, the University of Washington, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, for example, which uh, takes a, a completely different way of, of modeling the epidemic and just looking at the deaths because we have better data on deaths. We can maybe extrapolate uh, where we are going looking at the trends in the deaths mm -hmm. over time rather than estimating how many people have it because it's so hard to identify all those people. Uh, and they give a much lower estimate than the Imperial College estimates, for example. But uh, I would say that mostly it's helpful for me to think about <clears throat> what is the impact of these measures that we're taking. So in the unmitigated scenario, you know, the Imperial College uh, estimates are saying you could see two million deaths. I don't think that is a realistic scenario. But I do think that it's important to know that if you put into place social distancing, if you put into place the contact tracing and the very pu basic public health interventions that need to be put into place, that you could drastically reduce what that unmitigated scenario tells you. And that's really what we need, what, what we need these models for, to tell us what we need to be doing, when we need to be doing it, for how long we need to be doing it, because that is their value as a tool, not necessarily predicting exactly how many people will die. I think that's almost uh, a fool's errand, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one thing that um, I just stepping back from a policy perspective, uh, often epidemiologists and modelers don't get much attention from policymakers. You know, you, you want policymakers to pay attention to your model, but they often don't. And I think in this context, because the, everything is moving so quickly and people are grasping and frightened and not really knowing what to do, some of these models are taking on incredible significance and actually changing what policymakers are deciding for good and, and maybe not so good because they're quickly moving. You know, as Josh just pointed out, all the, the limitations of models, that they're really useful tools, but they don't necessarily tell you everything. And there's a lot of assumptions, but we actually have seen governments, um, the UK, our government, changing what they're doing because of what a model says. And that yeah. has risks, even if it is, you know, could, could be helpful. Yeah. Now, it, we, we've talked a bit about the, it's hard to know about the course of the disease if we don't have enough information on the denominator, how many people have it and don't have it. And as I think most people know by now, the U.S. didn't do testing early enough. Is that fair to say? And Jen, yes. I know you've worked across the world and so forth. Uh, we had an opportunity to use the World Health Organization's testing, and, and why did the U.S. go alone in testing and not work with the WHO? 
Yeah. So yes, there are a lot of um, challenges to the U.S. On, in testing, and and it has not gone well, and it's still not great. Um, early on, um, when you know have a new when you have new virus or, or um, that's discovered, you sort of have to race to figure out how do you measure it? How can you create a diagnostic to look at it? And the WHO, as I understand it, um, was working was able to use something that Germany developed. Um, in general, though, the U.S. doesn't tend to take. WHO's tests. The U.S. likes to develop its own tests. Um, and that's, the CDC was doing what it usually does. I think what, in retrospect, because um, there was such an urgency and it took a little bit of extra time and then the tests that the CDC developed didn't work properly, mm -hmm. that created a lot more attention to why didn't they just take the WHO's test? So I think the reality is CDC does did what it usually does, um, but it didn't work out so well. And that, that's, that created one of the first uh, real problems that we haven't quite gotten over yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, we've talked a lot about statistics and they are uh, impressive in a horrifying sense, uh, but they're abstract. I think most of us personally don't want to get sick, right? So we all know we should wash our hands and sing happy birthday a million times and we <laughs> should uh, socially distance six feet. I think people have gotten a better sense of exactly how far six feet is overall. But all that being said, who is at greatest risk. You mentioned some of the people at greatest risk of, of, of dying uh, from it, the elderly and the otherwise compromised. Are th are certain people at greater risk of, of, of getting sick in the first place, getting infected? So the evidence um, that that we've seen does not suggest that people are, you know, that someone's in an eight characteristic is going to put them at greater risk. What is the case, though, is it's really about how people live and who they're coming into contact with. And so um, that's what we're talking about, healthcare workers and other essential workers who, by nature of their positions, are interacting with people because they have to. And so they're really, with an infectious disease like this, it's how many contacts you have, how often are you coming into contact with the infectious agent, less so about anything about your um, your your own makeup. Um, it's so far, and you know, there are other um, diseases which might be a little different, but in this case, it really is about how who you're coming into contact with, whether you're protected from exposure, um, and then the real concern is what you know, how sick could you get? Um, especially since we have no therapeutic agents for COVID at this point, and clearly no vaccine. Um, but that's the that's the the reality. Really, is that's why we're doing social distancing, so you don't want to come into contact with this. Um, so speaking of social distancing, I've got a couple of audience questions I'm going to bundle together because they're in a similar vein. And one is very specific, saying Prince Charles in England left self-quarantine after seven days. Is that enough? And the paired question I'll say is, uh, China's controls seem to work a lot better than ours. Why is that? Mm. Well, why don't um, I, what, you, go, you can do the China one, and I'll do the... Yeah, yeah. You, want to, you want to take uh, Prince Charles? Prince Charles? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think... so. The, so the data that are out there will have looked at how long um, uh, uh, somebody could potentially be um, you know, need to be in quarantine period um, and uh, be infectious. Um, and the general, it could be as long as 14 days. Um, it's usually shorter. That is, is definitely the case, that it's usually shorter. Um, but 14 days, that's why everyone says, you know, take, that's where we had the initial 15 days of social distancing or stay in your house for a couple of weeks, just to make sure you're on that outside edge. Um, it's probably not the case that it's the full 14 days, but it is for some people. So I would say seven days is a little less than you would probably want to. That's not really what a lot of public health guidance says. Um, 14 days is, is probably the, you know, why, why not be a little safer, but um, we also don't know the full extent of of his the specifics of his situation, but it is 14 days. Would be if I were if I was giving you advice, I would say 14 days. And even if I were a prince, you'd say the same. Even if you were a prince, I would say 14 days. Good, Josh. What about China? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the uh, the China case is interesting. So so what happened in China is, of course, in the uh, area around Wuhan, where which was where this virus originally emerged. Um, they went into a lockdown period uh, as of January 23rd, and uh, because they saw a rapid rise in the number of cases and the number of deaths from this virus, and I don't think that the Chinese or you know, we to this day don't have a good sense of exactly how many people were infected, but clearly 
it was enough to cause the authorities to take what came to be fairly draconian measures in terms of controlling the movement of population. So they they essentially made everyone stay home uh, and uh, didn't allow anyone to take public, public transportation or move uh, in and out of their various cities and areas into other geographic regions of China. Now, the problem was, of course, many people had already moved from uh, Wuhan and from Ube province to other areas of China, who then went on and other people went on to seed epidemics in other countries. But leaving that aside, the effect of the lockdown, once it was put into place, was fairly dramatic. And, and uh, we have you know, epidemiological models which tell us that they reduce the transmission rate significantly because really what you're trying to do is prevent people from coming into public, uh, coming into contact in public. So person to person contact was drastically reduced. People only came into contact with those who were in households with them. Uh, and that was essential to reducing the transmission. But I will say they've had also success because at the same time they had these lockdowns, they dramatically ramped up their public health interventions. That meant they scaled up their testing. They tested everybody that they could and they rapidly ramped up their capacity to test. They set up fever screenings everywhere and anyone who went anywhere got screened uh, for a fever. And if you were detected as having a fever, you were sent to a fever clinic uh, and you were given a test for, for COVID. Uh, if you were positive, you were put in a place uh, which was separate from other locations in order to, you're basically isolated uh, if you were positive. And people who, uh, who might've been exposed were told to quarantine um, and they, basically tracked movements of people in order to make sure that these uh, lockdowns were actually uh, being followed. Uh, and all of these measures together led to what we saw was uh, this turnaround and they turned the tide on the epidemic. And still in places in, in Wuhan, uh, they're still in lockdown in many locations. Uh, because of the risk of reintroduction of this virus and, uh, but, uh, I'd say that they had a suite of different interventions, not only you know the social distancing, but also the very core public health things that needs to be in place in order to control an epidemic like this. So a lot of the things they did. One thing I do want to drill into a little more is lockdown, because a lot of my friends will say to me, oh, I'm in lockdown. They're actually sheltering in place. Could you just quickly describe the difference between lockdown and sheltering in place? Because a lot of us feel like we're in lockdown, but I gather we're not. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, a lockdown is not a technical term, but basically we're using it as shorthand to say that everyone is confined to their residences uh, and not allowed to go out except on a very minimal basis. Um, and those measures are in strictly enforced. So you actually had authorities make sure that no one did go out and also a geographic quarantine around uh, these cities and uh, provinces, meaning people could not travel from one location to another. It wasn't allowed. Uh, therefore, uh, that is not something, for example, we see here. Uh, it, and uh, it's, uh, it's a different level of, uh, of restriction than we've seen in this country. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have gradually moved forward in this country from a a suggestion that people not congregate in groups to actually these stay at home, uh, you know, orders in many locations where I am in, in, in Maryland, they just announced, uh, you know, a, a, a mandatory stay at home, uh, you know, and only essential you know, business can be done outside. This is a, a new development. It's not quite the, the Wuhan lockdown, but it's uh, definitely a step uh, in that direction. Gotcha. Well, I mean, I'll give you another. So part of it is about enforcement. Right. So we, when we think about a lockdown, it, it tends to has, convey that there's more of enforcement. I mean, there are enfor in what Josh was talking about, both in, in Maryland and, and certainly now in Washington, D.C. and Virginia and other places. If you don't if you vi are found to be violating what the recommendation is, you can be fined um, and charged with a misdemeanor. So that's actually somewhat enforcement. Um, but it's not enforcement like has happened in some other places where people really are not allowed to leave them ho their homes without special permission. Um, or to take walks or things like that. So there are some places where you actually have to show your identification. You're only able to walk within a certain perimeter of your area where you live. 
for a certain amount of time. So that would probably count more as a lockdown than we have had in the U.S. Yeah. My daughter has a friend in Hong Kong. He just yeah. returned to the United States, was not sick at all, but had two weeks of home. Some house arrest. Uh, yeah, I, you know, and I would say that also that a lockdown is not a necessary condition for addressing this yeah. epidemic. I mean, we've seen countries and locations that have been able to address it without using lockdowns. And, and we can point to uh, South Korea as one of those uh, examples. Uh, and in certainly other Asian countries, Singapore and, uh, and, and Hong Kong to, to an extent as well. So it's not that you have to have a lockdown to be effective, but in the case of China, that was their approach. They took a very uh, authoritarian approach to uh, restricting people's movements. But it's not the only way to go. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think what a lot of people want to think about is is what's next. I mean, we we know the president, uh, President Trump, had initially said we want to be open for business by Easter. Uh, yesterday, I think, following the advice of some of his advisors, he said, "Well, that we're going to be really extending the restrictions, the recommended restrictions, until the end of April." So forth. Josh, sounds like where you are, it's even later. Um, what's the prospect for the next two or three months, and, and when do we think we're likely to be able to get back to a relatively normal life? And I'll just throw in one other little a console to this question uh, that a, a, an audience member asked: "Said my elderly parents are in New Jersey. When can they expect to leave home?" When we do release people into more of a normal life, will that be in stages or will it be all at once? Yeah, um, so I can, can I can jump in here first. Yeah. Here, uh, so it, the the difficult thing is that it's 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 impossible to predict exactly when this will be over. We just don't know the answer to that, and it all depends on how uh, the epidemic progresses and how successful we are in implementing the measures that are necessary to interrupt the transmission and see those case numbers go down. Go down. But but essentially what we're going to have to be looking for is an interruption in transmission so that rather than the rising numbers of cases and deaths that we're seeing right now, we're actually seeing declining numbers of cases and deaths and hopefully, you know, get to the point of seeing no cases and deaths in a given location. So uh, to your point about, uh, you know, the different stages, there, there, we're in different stages in different parts of this country. and. Therefore, uh, the resolution will come at likely at different times. It's not going to be all at once or um, all the same in every location. Uh, we, what we need to be able to do is monitor the conditions uh, on the ground, and, and that requires testing and requires public health intervention in order to understand what's happening in a location. When you do see those cases go down for an extended period of time, for example, 14 days, uh, you know, then that's the incubation period recommendation that we were just talking about, then you can be a little bit more uh, confident that relaxing measures in a given location might be a policy option. Um, but even in that case, just referencing your last question about the, uh, you know, the elderly parents, there will be extra care given, is my assumption, on uh, those high-risk populations, those people who might be at high risk for uh, complications uh, f and you know, hospitalizations from this virus, it might take a little bit longer for the recommendations to come out for those folks to uh, sort of move about and, and interact as they might have before this epidemic happened. But yes, it will happen in stages. Unfortunately, it's impossible to predict exactly when it will happen, but that's what we're shooting for, getting those cases down through these measures that we're taking right now. So, Jen, if you wanted to add in. Yeah, I, I would just add there are so many factors that are going to affect the success of these efforts in any given jurisdiction. And there are going to be some factors about, you know, how people are responding to social distancing, um, healthcare worker capacity, protective gear, um, all kinds of things that are, are just are very different across the country. And you have some states, for example, Florida, Georgia, where within the state, different counties have different measures in place. So counties that are even adjacent to each other, some have stayed at home orders, some haven't done it yet. Um, that doesn't necessarily bode well for, you know, a, from a public health and, uh, perspective of looking at infectious disease. So we're, we're differentially attacking this problem and it means that we're gonna have very different um, success rates mm -hmm. uh, in different parts of the country. 
I guess another issue is, uh, you know, we were up to 161,000 cases. Uh, fortunately, deaths, is, as Josh points out, lo low single digits still adds up to a lot of people, but all those other people presumably recover. So it's key question is whether the people who recover then have immunity. How certain are we of that? That's a good question. And, you know, this is a new virus. We're still learning about it. Uh, I think that the evidence uh, and, and our our understanding of how respiratory viruses like this work, uh, including other coronaviruses, um, show that your expectation is that there is immunity, at least at a short-term basis, meaning in, in the months after you have recovered from infection, most likely you are protected uh, you have protective immunity, or at the at the very least, you know you're not going to get another serious bout of, of this virus. Um, the longer term picture is uh, not as easy to say because uh, it is uh, it is uh, something that we've seen in in other respiratory viruses that immunity can wane over time. And so, if we're talking about years in the future, then you might have a worry about people's immunity waning. But I think it's quite clear, at least from the best of our understanding right now, people are immune for the most part after infection with this virus and can feel safe that they won't get infected. Now, will that apply to 100% of people? Well, that's maybe not the case, but the, the vast majority of people that will be the case. And that's really important because if that is, you know, to the extent that we that is the case, which is, as Josh said, we, we believe it is, those individuals could go back to work potentially, could be, you know, if they're healthcare workers, they could be going, helping on the front lines um, in the healthcare system. So it's a really important thing to figure out um, as part of what potentially could help us. Yeah, and, and we wouldn't have to necessarily guess because we could develop tests, yes, tests. tests for, you know, uh, antibodies in your blood to see yep. that you have protective antibodies which are a pretty good indication that you are protected from this uh, virus and you've achieved a, a level of immunity. Well, it seems like a key point. Also, it makes it sort of emotionally confusing. You know, I, I have a cousin who texted me the, yesterday who said, I have tested positive, but I got a very mild case. And mm -hmm. if, if it turns out that in a couple of, in a week or so, he's, he's done and he can go out and work and can't get anybody else infected, in a sense, you know, <laughs> mixed feelings because the, if you never get the disease, you're worried about getting it. If you've actually had the disease and get, or in the eighty percent has a mild case, then you're you're safe, right? We think. Yeah, so, yeah, that's you. right. And, and, there will be and, people out there who who became infected, didn't know it, and are immune. Uh, you know, if you are asymptomatic, truly asymptomatic, then you may have never known you were infected, and yet you are protected. Yeah. And there's a so, lot that that people who are in that situation could do to help inform um, the development of, of, you know, curative measures and other things. I think part of the issue you mentioned earlier is we're not testing. So we're not even doing basic diagnostic testing, let alone serologic testing, the kind that Josh is talking about, where you can actually start to identify who has antibodies to this, who is immune, and what can we learn from them. That, that's like way beyond the capacity of the systems that we're talking about right now. All right. Well, Jen, let me follow up with a question there because I know you have some strong feelings about this. And that is, how is the U.S. government doing? You know, wh what has it done well and what hasn't it done well? Because I know testing is one place where it's been heavily criticized. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the U.S. government is, is in part suffering from what most governments around the world um, suffer from, which is really hard for politicians and for governments, for national governments to prepare for what we know, what epidemiologists and others working in public health know, there are going to be outbreaks. There are going to be infectious disease outbreaks, pandemics. It's sort of a given in our field. We we know it, and um, you know people are always pounding on the table to get uh, governments to do more to prepare. And governments just, for a lot of reasons, um, don't prepare in the way that they should. So that was certainly the case with the U.S. government not um, having sufficient preparedness. Where, for example, you know, figuring out where you would need to have ventilators, what you would do about hospital surge capacity, all these things that you know would be issues if there's an outbreak, um, that was not was insufficient. So that's one one big challenge, and it's not unique to the U.S. I think what we've seen in the U.S. case um, is a real lack of wanting to acknowledge uh, that there was a problem in the beginning, 
And with an infectious disease, and we you sort of just look at any of the data, the doubling rate, how quickly the cases are doubling and how quickly we're seeing um, rapid uh, multiplication of cases, every you know hour that you're not addressing it matters incredibly, especially with a highly infectious disease. And um, that is what happened here, where we had a very long period. It wasn't just a testing issue, but we had a long period where the federal government was uh, at least not publicly in a uniform voice saying, this is a problem, this is a national emergency, we have to jump jump on it and marshal every power and, and, and ability we have to get ahead of this, as some other governments did. So that delay um, has, is really costing us now. And then another factor I would say um, that, so I would put that at the sort of at the feet of the federal government. And we're still seeing some problems there. We're not having necessarily one message coming out. It's changing a lot. Um, and you know, in, in this kind of situation, public health authorities and government official government officials don't have all the answers, but they should actually level with people and just tell people what they do know and what they don't know. That's I think really what we know from past experience works best. But the other problem that that we're confronting now in the US, which isn't the failure of one government or not, one, the federal government or not, is we have a federal system. So we have the federal government and we have the state governments and the, they have different authorities. They don't all do things that, you know, we don't have a national, even though there are some national authorities and the federal government hasn't mandated certain things across the country and in some cases it can't. And so that gives you this sort of piecemeal approach. Um, and in a sense, what we're seeing competition across the country for very you know, limited supplies, and that's really not a great way to approach uh, fighting a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I give the government a mixed, mixed grade here. I see. And Josh, let me ask you, if I could give you a time machine, you go back to January 1st of this year, uh, three months ago, and uh, you can only say one thing, you can only tell the federal government one thing that they should do differently. What's the first thing, what's the main thing you tell them? Well, the main thing is to get the testing right. I mean, we need to, we needed a test early and we needed to understand where this virus was. And we didn't have that uh, ability ramped up quickly enough. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was, I think, the, um, the Achilles heel in the response from the beginning. And we're still playing catch up because of that uh, lack of ability to test. So if there's one thing I could change, I think that would have made a big difference. And it would have... Uh, allowed us to make more informed decisions about you know the kinds of policies that need to be in place and uh, because we would have had a better sense that uh, this virus had actually spread quite broadly quite widely very earlier very much earlier than we you know have come to realize now so it, it's um, it, it was it was like you know uh, battling something in the dark and we, we just really weren't sure um, what we were fighting and where we were fighting it, we um, we could have at least shed some light having a better test in, in place. What I would what I would say on January first, twenty twenty, the report from China was available outside of China on December thirty first. So January first was really the first day. I, I would have, we know that some people in the federal government, CDC, and others probably got that report right then. What I would say now is red alert. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. That's when you, from the top, you get you go onto high alert. Pay attention. Treat it as a potential real threat, and mobilize. Put your plan in place. That clearly didn't happen. Um, that plan would have included testing ramp up for sure. Gotcha. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the partisan issues. And I mentioned that Kaiser does uh, Kaiser Family Foundation does some of the biggest, some of the biggest tracking poll of Americans and how they think about healthcare. And you recently turned that to. Uh, uh, coronavirus issues particularly, although the last test was almost two weeks ago and, and a lot changes in two weeks, but still one of the things I thought was interesting there was some of the partisan differences. So for instance, uh, you know, with the test shortages, uh, two thirds of the public said, and this is going back about two weeks, two thirds of the public reported that they could get a test if they needed. However, that varied a great deal by party affiliations. Republicans, 73% thought they could get a test if they needed it. Independents, 67%. Democrats, only 54%. So why the differences in perception? Yeah, well, I think the the other things we saw a lot of partisan differences in our poll actually. When we asked about how worried people were, you know, we found very high levels of concern and worry um, from you know many people in the country. When you looked at the partisan um, divide, 
we actually found Democrats much more worried than Republicans. Um, Democrats were much more, just in general, expressed more concern, more fear about disruption, more fear about not being able to get tested, not being able to afford their medical costs than Republicans did. So what's driving that? Clearly, as, as we said earlier, um, you know, this, this uh, uh, Disease, this infectious uh, agent is is anyone can be susceptible to it, and we're already there are already high profile cases of people who have gotten sick and um, are facing a lot of challenges. So, um, really, I think what it comes down to is where you get your information, who you trust, um, and and what you you know sort of preconceived notions about um, what if you're hearing that something's a crisis or not. And where you're hearing it is driving what a lot of people think. Now we're we just are coming out of the field right now with a new poll. We'll have it out in a couple of days, and I, I think we'll see some some differences because when we put out our last one, it was right before most of the states moved to um, uh, stay-at-home orders, closing schools, um, before the president really started speaking, changing his tune a little bit about the seriousness that we're that we're ex experiencing. So I'm. Be very curious to see if that how how deep that divide is now, but it really I think is a reflection of where what people want to believe and who they want to want to trust. Um, and uh, it's the testing one is interesting because most of those people probably hadn't tried to get a test yet, so it'll it'll be interesting to see if anything changes. No, I certainly yeah, just something to add that um, that it it's. Um, it, yeah, it's touched so many more people now. I think as yeah. the number of cases have run, and, and it's it's spread over a much more uh, a, a broader geography of the United States, that there, it, we can only expect there to be differences uh, in it. once if if you think about it in the abstract, like in your community, in your state, maybe uh, you know two weeks ago, if you had only a handful of cases or not even any cases. <laughs> You might not consider this to be something that you would have to worry about. That's changed for so many places right now that um, you know I would I would expect the the results, and I'm, I'm you know I'll be very interested to see what those yeah. results say. Yeah, I want to talk. We got a question from the audience about universal coverage, and I want to ask this sort of in two ways. Uh, one is, as I think most people know, the U.S. is alone among the wealthier countries to lack universal healthcare coverage, and my. The two-part question is, how do we think that's making it, is that making a difference in this crisis? And the audience question was, how might this crisis impact a desire uh, for the public to push towards universal coverage? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, there's lots of ways to think about it. So one is, um, you know, the is there a predisposition of, of countries that have universal health coverage to do a better job in responding to their epidemics, I'd say no. We're see, there. There are several countries out there um, that have, a set, you know, universal coverage that are, are have sort of uh, struggled to get ahead of their epidemics. So that that alone is not a precondition for a, a good response. Where it does play, make a difference is what happens to people who need to get health services, um, who need to get specifically for coronavirus for COVID, for if they for COVID disease. So. Um, that's where it really comes into play, where you have a situation in the U.S., and, and this is pretty unique to the United States, where people um, in the beginning of what the outbreak were concerned about what maybe they shouldn't even try to get a test because they couldn't afford it, or were they going to get surprise medical bills? What if they were uninsured and they um, were afraid to go and, and, and get uh, services? Um, and now we have this coming up more and more with the cost of care. So if someone gets hospitalized because of COVID, or needs to get, you know, uh, brought in an ambulance um, because they're sick. Um, the bills that might be associated with their care. Um, that this is a pretty uniquely American challenge. Um, we have multiple payers. You have private health care. You have Medicaid. You have Medicare. The VA, et cetera. And so we have this fragmented um, system that, you know, when you have a crisis, is it's very obvious that that we have all of those challenges. And I, I would say that. The Affordable Care Act um, passed 10 years ago actually has made a huge difference in um, evening out some of those differences in some cases and providing many more millions of people with coverage. But still, there's uh, many millions who don't have health coverage and are going to face challenges with bills. And um, that is very much a, a, a U.S. problem. Now, will this lead to change? Um, already, Congress has passed, Congress just passed its third emergency or supplemental bill to deal with this crisis, and I'm sure it's not the last one. 
in the in the second one and the one that just got passed, uh, they've essentially made testing free for the most part for most people, um, which is you know significant. Um, and but what hasn't happened yet is uh, dealing with the cost issue of of care and treatment. So um, and that's an outstanding issue. But will this have a lasting impact? We don't know yet. Well, I know that uh, just recently, in the last couple of days, uh, several major national commercial insurers, Aetna, Humana, and Cigna, have all said that they are going to waive out-of-pocket costs for anything coronavirus-related testing or treatment, which is good. Now, those are tends to be many of the people who have some of the better health insurance. Medicaid, the program which is largely for lower-income people, doesn't have many much cost-sharing at all. So again, you have pretty good uh, coverage in various patches of our system but with many people left out from that. And of course, the people who are uninsured don't get any of that. Definitely, I mean, I think Sorry, the, the, treatment, the treatment side is, is really the, the, uh, one of the biggest remaining gaps right now. And I think as we're, more cases um, are, more and more people are going to the hospital, more people are getting sick, we're gonna hear more and more stories about this. These are things that everyday Americans have been facing for quite a while. Um, we at KFF and then our, our independent news um, uh, service, KHN, has been documenting this for quite a while. People that have surprise medical bills um, go in to get care for something and, and come out with you know huge bills uh, that they didn't expect. Um, we're going to start to see that if it's not addressed. And so, um, you know, these are everyday problems. But when you have a, a crisis of this magnitude, they will become much more um, visible. And uh, I think that actually may result in some more likelihood to have some change down the road. Interesting. You know, one of the things that also came out in your in the, in the KFF poll is people's concern about going to work or not going to work if they're sick and their income and so forth. And I think we know that relative to other countries, the U.S. has very limited sick leave policies. That's particularly yes. true for employees at smaller companies, contractors, gig workers, and so forth. And of course, the concern is that if you don't get sick pay, uh, you go to work and uh, you infect others there, perhaps. I know that that the bills, the stimulus bills, have tried to address some of that. But overall, do you think that this pandemic, when that when that when the dust settles, could result in in long term changes in things like sick leave policies? Yeah, I mean, I think the we, there's been a long discussion nationally about we, the poor policies we have on sick leave in the United States. I mean, that's you know it's been brought up and it's it's um, uh, an issue that hasn't gotten a lot of traction. Maybe sometimes it ebbs and flows. I think now in this national crisis, the fact that it's so obvious and such a challenge for so many workers in this country, um, may it may break through a little bit. I mean, as you mentioned, um, it's been dealt with to some extent by Congress um, and, uh, and that will help, uh, but it's not the full story. But you know, I just like Josh doesn't want to predict how many cases we're going to um, have and how many deaths. I don't want to predict whether this will have a lasting impact on the U.S. healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But it certainly is the case that these issues that um, many people did not either pay attention to or maybe not care about or not know about are going to be much more obvious as this crisis deepens. And I, one thing I, I think we can probably agree on is that it's going to get worse before it gets better, for sure. Something that's happened that I didn't expect, frankly, even though I spend all of my time thinking about the healthcare system, is that uh, because medical groups and physician offices have been discouraging people from coming in unless they really need to, because of course the best place to catch a disease is at a doctor's yeah. office or a hospital, they've cut way down on their visits. And a lot of people are doing this without being encouraged. So I heard recently that medical groups in Boston are laying off people substantially because their visits are down 75%. Um, and you always think about, well, our system is going to be overburdened. Yes, our hospitals, but not necessarily our physician offices. So how do you think that might affect our healthcare system long, long term if we're actually laying off people for the first time in healthcare, which has usually been the nation's most reliable employment sector? Yeah, I, I actually don't have a crystal ball on that. I think that's a whole um, area of the impact of this that is, is what the ripple effects are going to be there. Hard to know. But you know, good reminder that healthcare sector, as you mentioned, it's not just people who are saving lives. It's also it, it's about employment of a huge swath of, of that supports the, the economy, and um, those kind of that challenge is is not it's not clear how it's going to affect things down the road for sure. Um, I thought you where I thought you were going to go with that was telemedicine actually. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's part of what we're seeing yeah. more of as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, much more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you also found in your survey that uh, a large percentage of the people who, who either work in healthcare themselves or household members who work in healthcare are worried about getting sick, of course. And, you know, it's nice. My, my friends in New York City tell me that every night at seven o'clock or something, people throw open their windows and sing and applaud the healthcare workers. And that's great. I'm sure they feel well supported, moral support that way. But is there more that we can do than just sing to them or clap for them? What else can we do to support our healthcare workers? Well, I, mean, I think the, the biggest thing that healthcare workers need is uh, protective equipment. Um, and so anything that people can do to support that, and there's a range of activities, but that frankly is probably the biggest need right now. I don't know if, if Josh would probably agree that that is without that, that's why they feel so vulnerable. I mean, yes, they're, they're, it's a crisis. They're working long hours. They're seeing sick people and that's really, really hard but they're afraid because they're not feeling safe and to not feel safe as a healthcare worker is, and having to do this day and to find ways to support them, I think is really critical. And that's the main factor. Um, I think there's other, other things that we don't tend to think about when, when we think about our healthcare workers now on the front lines that are, that have families that are spending, some of them are having to, you know, their self, they're, they're isolating themselves from their families to protect their families. So they're going long periods of time of not seeing their, their families um, because they're afraid of exposing them. That puts some tremendous strain on, on people's lives. And so there's a lot of other ramifications that are you know, barely scratching the surface right now. You know, I've had telemedicine for a decade or two. Um, uh, is this gonna ramp it up? Uh, it's obviously ramping up in the short term. Do you think it can ramp up in the long term? It'll, it'll fundamentally change some of the way that we see doctors or, or treat patients. I mean, it, I, I think it is, it is ramping up significantly. I, you probably have gotten you know notices from your providers saying, I'll do telemedicine. And, and Congress has made that easier in some cases related to COVID and, and taken away some of the barriers. I think what we'll see is that the it, it's actually works in more cases than people probably realized. And, and that maybe will pave the way for, for more use of telemedicine. There'll probably be some other things that come up that don't work so well. There might be some you know, types of services or, or, or other issues where there, people have raised privacy issues. So I don't think it's, you know, it's not gonna be a panacea, but I think that it is likely to be sort of proof of concept that it can actually work in a much more widespread way than people have yet been allowing for. Mm-hmm. Josh, when I asked you uh, the unfair question about when is this going to be over, you know, you mm-hmm. talked about some of the things we look for and so forth. But um, what what will be the markers where we and, and what, do you think that will be something that is more of a of a, bl- a blanket for the country, region by region? We'll just say it's anybody who's had the disease can go back because now they're immune. Uh, younger people can go back. It's been, it's been, I've, some people say young people should go back because they're less likely to get sick and die from it. Um, when do you think we'll know more about that, and, and, and what do you think the decisions were made? Yeah, well, you know, the social distancing measures that are put in place now, and, and they're the patchwork, of course, and different locations have more stringent ones, and different uh, locations have much less stringent ones. Uh, the whole idea there is to interrupt the transmission and start to bring the uh, number of cases down. And Uh, I think we're already starting to see uh, the impact in places like San Francisco and even in uh, New York to some extent, where uh, uh, measures put in place two weeks ago uh, are having a tangible effect on the number of cases. Instead of seeing that rapid rise, we're seeing maybe a crest and and, and, uh, maybe we're heading back down the other end of of that uh, initial epidemic curve. Um, And... And, and really, it's, it's going to be uh, monitoring and making sure that that trend continues and going down. Now, uh, you raised the point about um, you know, young people, and uh, there had been this discussion uh, out there uh, prompted by uh, in, in epidemic models about trying to get to a point where we achieve herd immunity uh, and the United Kingdom and the Netherlands uh, had at different points uh, taken uh, it upon themselves to try and achieve herd immunity by basically uh, uh, protecting those at highest risk, the elderly and those with uh, you know, chronic conditions, 
but allowing others to sort of circulate, get infected, and then and and then achieve uh, you know a certain level of immunity in, in the population. Uh, the, the problem with that, and I think there's been a lot of backtracking on that particular approach, is you know there's a number of reasons why. Because we know that young people, uh, even though they're not as seriously affected as older people, can get seriously infected and hospitalized and even die. Uh, so it's not like they're completely immune from this uh, virus. And you know, in ad in addition, <clears throat> that there's uh, a feeling that. Uh, those people can uh, bring uh, the infection to loved ones who are in those risk categories. So how do you completely seal off different populations effectively uh, on a short, you know, in a short uh, period of time? It's it's very difficult to imagine how that would all work. Uh, and uh, so the and the other thing is that you know you have to get to a fairly high level of infection across a population in order to achieve herd immunity. We're talking about maybe 50 to 60% of an entire population getting infected in order to achieve this herd immunity level. That is the point where the virus can't find in another person to infect, and therefore you basically you know, vaccinated the entire population. Um, it's going to take a long time, and a lot of people will be hospitalized and die because of that particular approach. So I don't know if we, <laughs> that's not, at least from my mind, a very, um, that, that's not the way that you're going to really uh, minimize the impact of this uh, infection. Uh, more likely is that we're going to see waves of infection over time. Maybe we'll see a reduction in cases over the summer, both because we've been putting in place these measures and because of the seasonality that we might see with this virus. But then we have the risk of being reintroduced in uh, the fall, and uh, therefore the risk is, is going to be there for a number of months, if not you know years going forward. So the ultimate uh, you know tool that we need is a vaccine, of course. And and I know you're talking about that in a different session. But if we can look forward to a vaccine in 12 to 18 months and get that at, at a you know spread out at, in a, at a population basis, get people vaccinated. That's really going to, uh, of course, increase this herd immunity level and get us to the point where we don't necessarily have to put in measures as we were in the past. Great. Thanks. Uh, getting down to the end of the program, but I wanted to ask, there's been a couple of audience questions about testing. Simple question about where and how can I get tested easily? And a related one is, if you're getting tested for the disease, is that the same as knowing if you have immunity and go back to work? I'll, I'll take the last one. Uh, the <laughs> testing, if you have the disease, what testing we're talking about is testing for having the virus in your body right now. So they take a swab of your, you know, throat or nose uh, area, and 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 then they look for the virus using uh, uh, you know, PCR machines. So that is different. Uh, if you are test positive with that type of test, then we you have active disease, right? Um, if you Became infected and then you resolve that infection and you uh, weren't and had you you basically eliminate the virus from your body, you would no longer test positive with that particular type of test. Uh, but at that point, uh, you know, weeks after you've resolved the infection is when you would turn to that blood test to look for the antibodies, which would tell you whether you are uh, uh, immune or at least have an immune response to the to the virus. So yeah, those are two separate things and uh, you know it's a good question to bring that up. So thanks. And the second test is under development, but we don't have it yet. Right. It's not available in any it's it's in experimental stage right now. And I know there are countries that do have sero serology. It's mm -hmm. China and Singapore, I believe, do and Hong Kong perhaps, but no country is using it at a widespread basis yet, and certainly not here in the United States. Okay. So on the other question about where you get tested. Um, this is a big issue. So because the U.S. has not did not have testing early enough and has not been able to, um, to you know, get testing out at, in a widespread way, um, there's limits and there's so much community transmission. Basically, what that has meant is we've had relatively strict guidelines about who should get tested, even though any doctor can decide because there's not enough tests and there's not enough people to, to provide those tests. There's not enough protective gear for people to give them. Basically, the recommendation is give testing to those who are sick with symptoms and healthcare workers. So if you're not presenting with real severe symptoms, 
or you're not a healthcare worker, it's going to be really hard to get a test. And there's a lot of story people we all know, I'm sure at this point, people who are not able to get tested and being told you're not sick enough, just go home and stay there, self-isolate for a couple of weeks or until you feel better. And, uh, you know, we, you may never get a test. So that's, that is an issue. Definitely. Not very satisfying. Okay. Well, I appreciate those thoughts. Uh, before we close, I want to remind everybody that part two of this program with KFF CEO Drew Alvin will be held on May 4th at noon Pacific time. And everybody who's registered for this program will be notified as soon as registration opens for that program. I also want to encourage people to join us for our next two scheduled programs in the Commonwealth Club series on COVID-19 done in association with the Zetima Project. First is this Friday, April 3rd at 12 noon Pacific. And when we'll talk about COVID-19, the merging tests, vaccines, and cures. And on Tuesday, April 7th, I fumbled the Monday first, but it's definitely Tuesday, I've been told, April 7th at 4 p.m. Pacific time, we'll track how healthcare organizations are faring with reports from the field from some top leaders at a large hospital system, a big physician group, and a large health insurer. And there'll be more sessions, so please check out commonwealthclub.org to stay informed. I want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Jen Cates and Dr. Josh Michaud to the Kaiser Family Foundation for joining us today for uh, the Commonwealth Club program here. I want to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for their help in funding. And I want to thank all of you, especially those of you who offered such great questions. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. I am Mark Sitter of the Zetima Project, and now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you all.